So today we will be addressing one of the components of uh, hemophilia guideline for all, which is a new ambition of the World Federation of, of Hemophilia. These guidelines have been a collective uh, effort uh, from WFH and from many leaders uh, of the field of hemophilia around uh, the world. And today we will be focusing on chapter 10, which addresses musculoskeletal complications. Uh, this chapter is the result of the effort of multiple authors, uh, Dr. Punus, Dr. Goddard, Dr. Blamey, Dr. Al-Sharif, Dr. Klein, Report, Mohan, Pasta, Glenn Pierce, and Alok Srivastava uh, from many regions of the world. And they have strived to capture different aspects of the care of hemophilia, both in developing economies and uh, developed uh, countries. Uh, I have uh, two disclosures to make. Uh, I function as a paid consultant for Bayer and Novo Nordisk over the last uh, 12 months, and uh, typically uh, lecturing or addressing questions related to the care of patients with hemophilia. So from the musculoskeletal point of view, hemophilia is characterized by acute bleeds uh, over 80% of which occur in specific uh, joints, most commonly the ankle, knee, and elbow joints, and frequently, uh, but not with the greatest frequency, the hip, shoulder, and wrist joints. There are a few muscles which are uh, important in hemophilia care, uh, primarily the iliopsoas muscle, one that we don't get to see very often, and the gastrocnemius muscle, or the muscles of the calf. So these bleeds, recurrent bleeds, cause progressive joint damage, uh, which is a result of blood accumulation in the joint cavity and a resulting synovial inflammation leading to complications such as synovitis and uh, hemophilic arthropathy. Now, from the perspective of synovitis, which is the initial phase of synovial uh, of joint inflammation, uh, it, it usually occurs after acute hemarthrosis, and the synovium becomes inflamed, hyperemic, and friable. And failure to manage this acute synovitis usually results in recurrent hemarthrosis and subclinical bleeds. So regular assessments are required until the joint and the synovial condition are fully rehabilitated. This includes range of motion, muscle strength, and joint speed. Given that clinical signs do not always adequately represent the actual situation, ultrasound or MRI uh, is advised. And sometimes radiographs are not enough because they don't actually visualize these conditions. On the left uh, of your screen, you, you can see the typical appearance, appearance of a joint, which is viewed through an arthroscope. And notice how, how white the cartilage it, it is. Uh, this is actually a knee, and you can see the femoral condyle on the top portion of the screen and the tibial plateau on the lower portion of your screen. And you can't see synovium. It, it is actually typically translucent and limited to the periphery of the joint. On the right, you can see the appearance of inflamed synovium, which is now thickened uh, with increased vascularity. And uh, you can also identify deposition of hemosiderin, which is depicted in this orange sort of brick-like color that you see on the slide. So this, this is really the enemy, the synovial activation and all of the musculoskeletal care, uh, the early musculoskeletal care is dedicated um, and is the object of the multidisciplinary team to deactivate the synovium. Now, if synovitis uh, ensues, the synovial condition should be uh, physically reassessed after every bleed. And if you need to get clinical insight, additional clinical insight, ultrasound is the preferred uh, technique. And there are numerous. Uh, um, 
treatment opportunities, numerous educational opportunities to develop the ability to perform point of care ultrasound these days through WFH. Now, when it comes to the management of the chronic synovitis, the non-surgical treatments are those recommended. And there are several options which are available in different regions of the world, but the common denominator is that they're all, all of them are actually easy to perform and readily accessible to orthopedic surgeons and sometimes to rheumatologists or nuclear medicine specialists. This is a point where the patient should consult with an experienced musculoskeletal specialist. And um, once again, if the chronic synovitis is unresolved, non-surgical synovitis is certainly the first line of treatment. Now, if the synovitis is not resolved, then we enter a different circumstance that actually has to do with arthropathy, with joint damage. So hemophilic arthropathy can actually result from a single bleed, but more often results from recurrent bleeds. And there's a sequence which is uh, highly predictable. You first get uh, the joint bleed, you get synovial activation, and therefore you can move on to chronic cytovitis. And if this is not interrupted, then there, uh, there are erosions which take place on the articular surface. And eventually there is uh, the establishment of chronic hemophilic arthropathy. So chronic hemophilic arthropathy is the final stage of joint destruction, which often is present during the second decade of life, particularly if prophylactic therapy is unavailable. But even if it is available, there is a number of, of, of uh, details related to compliance with medication that are required to avoid uh, chronic hemophilic arthropathy. Now, this is an example of, of what happens to a joint that has undergone this, this sequence. So on the first slide on your left, we can see the asymmetry in the development of the femoral condyles in this knee, which produces an angulation, uh, a lateral angulation, so-called a valgus angulation on, on the knee. On the second slide, a unique feature of hemophilia is the disproportion in the anteroposterior dimension of the femoral condyles and the mediolateral dimension of the, fem of the femoral condyles. The latter are large and the former very narrow, and this pro provides some mechanical challenges and further in life, some reconstructive challenges if surgery is required. Further to the right, you can see an image from a magnetic resonance, an MRI, where the irregularity of the subchondral bone is obvious, the widening of the tibia, and the erosions on the, on the surface of the joint are quite apparent on this, on this image. And all of these combined characterize the so-called hemophilic arthropathy. Now, how is this management managed? Well, here is once again, another opportunity to make the best out of the multidisciplinary team. And uh, one must combine regular replacement therapy with, with physiotherapy or rehabilitation. That, that combination is extremely powerful. And even in the presence of x-rays or MRIs done, that, that, that show uh, articular deterioration, uh, patients can function, persons with hemophilia can actually have full lives uh, if these two are nicely combined. Uh, if, these, if these measures fail, if non-surgical measures don't work, then once again, this is the time to consult with an orthopedic specialist uh, and surgical uh, intervention options uh, start to emerge on the on the therapeutic uh, scenario. Now, in other uh, circumstances of musculoskeletal care different to hemophilia, 
um, muscle hemorrhages are not taken with great concern on behalf of the care team. But in patients with coagulopathies, this requires all of our attention. So a muscle hemorrhage is defined as an episode of bleeding into a muscle, uh, which is determined clinically, uh, just by physical exam, or by imaging studies. Um, it may occur in any muscle and is usually associated with pain, uh, swelling, and great functional impairment. If untreated, they can result in compartmental syndromes with secondary uh, neurovascular and tendon uh, contractures and, and damage to the muscle, and sometimes even muscular necrosis and retractions. So these bleeds need to be treated immediately and actually taken very seriously by the musculoskeletal uh, team. I think the image may be familiar to most of you uh, watching this presentation. It is uh, a young boy with a an antalgic position, in this case, with a flexion of the knee and uh, an equinus of the, of the ankle uh, to relax the gastrocnemius muscle that is increased in, in girth by what is apparent clinically uh, as a bleed uh, as depicted in the picture. Now, under these conditions, the patients must be monitored continuously for possible compartment syndrome, pain, and all of the signs and symptoms known to musculoskeletal specialists should be monitored with great care. And if the evidence is uh, conclusive of compartment syndrome, then earlier fasciotomies uh, are associated with improved patient outcomes. Now here is a situation with where great communication with the hematologist uh, is required. Uh, because from the surgical standpoint, a, an incision, an extensive incision is going to be made. And it is important to understand what the coagulation behavior would be in patients that undergo fasciotomy. So this is, a, this is once again, a multidisciplinary decision where communication is, is of, the, of the essence. Now, sometimes subclinically, other times, because muscular bleeds were not managed uh, carefully or they were not followed for a, the necessary length until they were completely resolved, uh, pseudotumors uh, appear. They are a rare complication of hemophilia consisting of a progressive cystic swelling of muscle and or bone. They typically develop as a result of inadequately treated soft tissue bleeds, usually in muscle adjacent to bone. Uh, and then the bone can actually be secondarily uh, involved, which is quite surprising. These lesions should be assessed and serially followed by ultrasound imaging. Uh, CT scan and MRI may be uh, useful for additional detail, which is often required. The management depends on the size, uh, on the site and location, the growth rate, and of course, the, the effect that the pseudotumor is having on the adjoining structures. They are lesions that are, are really surprising. And in, in, uh, in peripheral areas where there is lack of awareness uh, of the presence of uh, the condition of hemophilia, then we must be very careful to advise uh, against the perception that they sometimes look like uh, malignant tumors. And, and mistakes can be made. Uh, here's an example of what is known as a gigantic pseudotumor of the pelvis. And it illustrates the behavior of these very benign lesions from the point of view of the histology, but uh, very invasive lesions from the point of view of their behavior. In this uh, situation, the lesion has grown through the pelvis and has resorbed the iliac wing, has uh, invaded the sacrum on the ipsilateral side, which of course produces compression of the sacral roots, and has come across to the contralateral side of the sacrum, uh, creating uh, further neurological signs. Um, these are large lesions that can be treated 
and that can be resected and required naturally a, a, a very sophisticated multidisciplinary team. Now the small early pseudotumors uh, frequently resolved with a short course uh, of treatment, uh, six to eight weeks of clotting factor replacement. And they require close monitoring for that reduction. And the reduction is actually the feedback that, that will uh, encourage treaters to carry on with, with uh, prophylaxis. Now the large ones are, may require surgical excision and once again require a very well-structured multidisciplinary team and a large hospital that, that has intensive care um, unit and all sorts of resources to make sure that, that the patient actually uh, undergoes a successful uh, resection and treatment of these lesions. Now, one can conclude that after uh, seeing uh, numerous bones and bone loss and loss of bone density that fractures can happen in, in persons with, with hemophilia and, and they do. Uh, fractures are not frequent in patients with hemophilia despite the high incidence of osteopenia and osteoporosis and probably has to do with the high level of awareness of persons with hemophilia of the care uh, of, their, of, their, of, their, of their musculoskeletal um, system. However, a patient with hemophilic arthropathy may be at risk for fractures around the joint uh, where there is significant loss of motion. And this is a particularly important uh, detail uh, because once there is a displacement of a joint and uh, the patient uh, reaches an endpoint around the knee, then there's a tendency for uh, supracondylar uh, fractures of the femur or tibial fractures as depicted on the, on the screen. And now, uh, from the point of view of, of healing, uh, uh, persons with hemophilia heal very similarly to persons without hemophilia. So healing is not a problem. What often is a problem are delays as is the case with this young boy on the screen where you see uh, uh, the, a callus was uh, actually taking place before proper treatment was uh, was um, performed, uh, essentially because of administrative uh, delays that may be common in many regions of of the world. And this young boy was actually developing a pseudo tumor around the fracture, as you can see on the posterior uh, aspect and most distal aspect of this lesion. Um, once again, because of the latency and the increased motion of the fracture site, which was not properly treated in traction or, immo or immobilization. So healing is not a, a problem, but uh, immediate treatment is required and certainly requires high levels of uh, uh, secondary prophylaxis, um, at least uh, 50 international units per deciliter and maintain for at least a week if proper immobilization is attained. Um, there are often questions about the use of external fixators, uh, which, is a, which is a good resource uh, if the fracture requires a such technique. technique. And certainly uh, one should avoid a prolonged joint uh, immobilization uh, uh, to uh, prevent contractures of, of the adjoining uh, articulations. Now, uh, there are a few recommendations uh, that, I, that are very useful in this uh, chapter of, of musculoskeletal complications that have to do with um, elective surgery. Uh, a frequent question has to do with multiple uh, site elective surgery uh, being simultaneously or, or staggered. And uh, this is certainly a, a recommendation uh, that uh, produces uh, a lot of uh, uh, savings in terms of uh, the use of factor concentrate and other uh, hemostatic agents that are often uh, scarce or, or costly. There are many tricks. Uh, uh, for this type of surgery. Uh, controlling uh, blood oozing is one of them. And here you can use uh, uh, lidocaine or bupivacaine with adrenaline. 
uh, to prevent bleeding dur during approaches. And uh, upon closure, uh, we recommend fibrin uh, sealing, sealant. And there are numerous presentations of the fibrin sealant. And uh, if you have a nice uh, uh, sprayer, uh, then, then small quantities of sealant can take you a long way. Uh, so this is something I recommend that you look for. Um, after surgery, um, you should be prepared to use post-operative continuous infusion of factor replacement. And once again, here are some additional uh, savings. And both uh, pre and post-operative physiotherapy are going to be required and should be uh, organized uh, uh, in a timely fashion to provide the best opportunity for, for rehabilitation. Uh, if everything else fails, a joint replacement is always an, an option. Uh, it should only be considered uh, if, if the patient is not responsive to non-surgical uh, or other surgical treatments. Uh, some complications are associated with joint uh, replacements, and this is the reason for, for this uh, prudent recommendation at this point. And once again, uh, in order to obtain the best uh, range of motion after a joint replacement, uh, physiotherapy should start as soon as, soon as possible. Four considerations that are, are useful uh, and come from other areas of joint replacement. Uh, the first one has to do with meticulous hemostasis, which is critical in persons with uh, hemophilia. There's usually no need for deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis uh, unless uh, there are very high plasma levels uh, that are required uh, during the post-op period because of some uh, hematological peculiarity in, in, in a patient. You can always use mechanical prophylaxis with compression stockings and sequential compression devices as well. Uh, antibiotic loaded cement uh, should be used in all cases where cement fixation is performed. And this is available uh, commercially in most of the countries. And uh, wound, wound uh, closure uh, should be taken to a different level of, of, of care uh, uh, to, to avoid bleeding or any other uh, opportunities for, for complications. Now, uh, there are some uh, psychosocial impacts of musculoskeletal complications. And I will divide them in, in two categories. Um, the, the initial psychosocial limitations uh, from hemophilic arthropathy are characterized by gait changes, uh, by the multiple joints that are being affected, and by the chronic pain that takes a toll on all patients. Now, the impact, the psychosocial, psychosocial uh, impacts are related to the lost time from work or the lost time from um, schooling, limitations, and sport participation, decreased socialization, um, negative self-perceptions related to body image, masculinity, or, or self-esteem, uh, lack of sense of normalcy, limited physical flexibility uh, that has to do with uh, sexual positioning and therefore impairment, challenges in personal relationships, role loss and or, or role changes, increase in, in fatigue, and uh, finally, uh, but very importantly, negative uh, coping behaviors. Two recommendations uh, that I, I think are of enormous relevance in, in closing for this presentation. Uh, the first is for patients with hemophilia who have chronic musculoskeletal pain or functional limitations, the World Federation of Hemophilia recommends psychosocial interventions tailored to meet the specific needs of each individual based on their physical, emotional, social, educational, and cultural circumstances. And uh, the second recommendation uh, for patients with hemophilia who have chronic musculoskeletal pain or functional limitations, the World Federation recommends the promotion of support networks, peer mentoring, and group educational opportunities to support their ability to cope with musculoskeletal complications, 
reduce social isolation, and strengthen resilience. In summary, uh, on this chapter of musculoskeletal complications of hemophilia, uh, firstly, recurrent bleeds uh, cause progressive joint damage. Uh, so it is critical uh, to decrease uh, synovial activation after this happens. Inadequate treatment of intramuscular bleeds can lead to muscle contractures, uh, often within the first decade of life. Uh, thirdly, prophylaxis is considered the standard of care. Successful treatment to achieve complete functional recovery generally requires a combination of clotting factor concentrate, replacement therapy, or other hemostatic coverage and physiotherapy. And finally, patient education on musculoskeletal issues in hemophilia is critical and should encompass joint and muscle health. I would like to thank you for listening. I hope I have done a good job in representing my colleagues from the musculoskeletal world in hemophilia who have contributed so generously uh, with the contents of this guideline. And I also hope that you find uh, the material useful uh, in solving the complexities that uh, come along with caring for young men and men with coagulopathies, specifically hemophilia. Thank you very much once again.